Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Johnson, and today I'll be taking you through a getting started tutorial on Visicol Histo and how best to use it for your tissue imaging needs. Now, it's very important to watch this video prior to using the Visicol Histo approach to ensure the best results. So for a background on Visicol Histo, it's a solvent-based tissue clearing technique that's similar to I, 3, U, and V-Disco, as well as BAB. Labeling is conducted prior to tissue clearing, so unlike techniques like Clarity, where the tissue clearing process is used to improve the penetration of antibodies into tissues. In this case, we're doing an iDisco immunolabeling approach prior to tissue clearing and then doing tissue clearing thereafter to render the tissue transparent for imaging. This approach is rapid, it's easy to use, and the tissues remain durable and easy to handle. Other techniques, especially protein hyperhydration techniques like scale and cubic, will make tissues quite fragile and they can be damaged during processing very easily. To get started, the place to go for the resources is our Visicol Histo uh, protocol guidebook, and this is at visicol.com backslash Visicol Histo protocol. Through this guidebook, you can see exactly how to use this technology for a wide range of use cases, different types of tissues, and different types of applications, such as imaging fluorescent proteins, or fluorescent proteins and immunolabeling, or just immunolabeling of your models. Now, the starting steps that you have to follow are first to go ahead and acquire the reagents and the buffers. So the Visicol Histo reagents can be purchased from visicol.com backslash store, or you can email info at visicol.com for a sample to try it out before you buy it. The uh, four reagents listed here are proprietary, and these do need to be purchased through our website or uh, through emailing us. But the buffers for the process, especially for immunolabeling, can be made uh, in your lab, and you probably have a lot of these ingredients already in your lab for our penetration buffer, blocking buffer, 10x washing buffer, and antibody buffer. Uh, but if not, you can buy these from us as well. So before we get started, one of the notes I wanted to point out is the use of methanol and ethanol. So many of the steps in the protocol were using methanol or ethanol. Methanol should be used with tissues where you're just looking at immunolabeling or other types of small molecule chemical dyes. Ethanol at 4C is suggested for using fluorescent protein. If you use methanol with fluorescent protein, it will quench the fluorescent protein. But if you do your processing of a fluorescent protein labeled tissue at 4C, and you use ethanol instead of methanol, you will preserve the endogenous fluorescence for imaging. So I just wanted to call that out prior to walking through the protocol. Now, as I mentioned, the permeabilization buffer is not required for all tissue, but it's typically used for tissues that are dense and challenging to label, tissues that are designed to keep fluids out, such as the liver, the kidney, FFPE tissue can be particularly hard to clear and to label, as well as human brain. So if you're working with one of these types of tissues or tissue configurations, please purchase the uh, permeabilization buffer for your processing. So before you get started, I want to point out that the most common error that we see are researchers trying to label and clear a whole mouse brain or a whole tissue the first time they use tissue clearing or Visicol Histo. The reason for this is that most folks see the Clarity publication or other publications where there's a brilliant three-dimensional map of a whole mouse brain or a whole tissue, and they want to replicate that. But in reality, that is an incredibly hard challenge to go after from an imaging perspective, from a labeling perspective, from a tissue processing perspective. There are a lot of things that have to go right to get that one pretty three-dimensional image of an entire tissue. And what I want to call out is that you should start small and optimize. If your goal is to label an entire hemisphere of a mouse brain, you should not start there. You should start with a 100 micron section and work your way up. The reason for this is your label might not be able to penetrate at all into dense 3D tissue. And you want to know that before you spend hundreds of dollars and weeks of time trying to process your tissues. So if you work stepwise up from 100 to 200 to 400 microns in thickness, as you optimize your labeling and image this will save you a tremendous amount of time in your research and allow you to move faster towards your research goal. Now, a couple key questions that you should always consider. First off, what is the smallest piece of tissue I can use to answer my research question? The reason this is so important is a lot of researchers want to image a huge volume of tissue, but tissue volumes thicker than one millimeter are going to require special optics or microscopes to image. They'll also be more challenging to label and to process than thinner tissues. So ideally, you want to have a thinner piece of tissue, of course not super thin because we're trying to replace traditional two-dimensional histology, 
but you don't want to go too thick because that creates a lot of problems. And mainly because labeling is dependent upon diffusion into tissues. And the thicker the tissue, the longer the diffusion process is going to take. And sometimes antibodies cannot penetrate that far into tissues. The other question to ask is, has the antibody that you're working with been validated before? So you can look on our website at the physical.com backslash validated antibody section to see a list of antibodies that we have validated for use with physical histo and the respective depths they can achieve into tissues. This is not an exhaustive list, so we update this quarterly, or you can email us at info at physical.com to get some more details on types of antibodies that we've worked with. And then lastly, has the optimal concentration for your label and incubation time been found? It's very important to optimize these parameters as you work way up from the thin tissue to your tissue thickness for your research question. Now, optimizing immunolabeling is a balancing act. You don't want to go too low, and you also don't want to go too high. The problem with going too high on your concentration is that the antibodies will tend to get stuck on the outside of your tissue, and you'll have a very dense ring around the periphery of your tissue, but no labeling on the interior. So optimizing that concentration to get uniformity and having high enough concentration is certainly a balancing act and needs to be optimized through that iterative step process. Now, for validating and optimizing antibody labeling, you can go to our website at physical.com backslash antibody optimization protocol and see a step-by-step -step protocol on how to actually optimize antibody labeling for a 3D cell culture model or a whole tissue. But generally, the process, like I mentioned before, is to start small with thin sections and work your way up as you optimize. Use dilutions between 1 to 50 and 1 to 500 and try to optimize between too high and too low based upon if the labeling is only on the surface or if it's very dim throughout the tissue you and work your uh, dilution and incubation times from there. Now, immunofluorescence is very stable in the physical histo tissue clearing process. So typically, we will clear a whole tissue with physical histo 1 followed by physical histo 2, or for a 3D cell culture model, we're clearing it with just physical histo M. And for imaging, these tissues will sit in physical histo 2 or physical histo M for imaging. And immunofluorescence stability is not a problem in either one of these solutions. And we've seen stability for over six months when stored at room temperature temperature away from direct lighting. The dehydration process is required prior to clearing with physical histo 1 uh, and 2 or physical histo M in many cases. And the reason for that is the physical histo tissue clearing technique works by refractive index matching. So replacing the cytosol within tissues, which has a low refractive index, with a much higher refractive index solution. But tissues will not become transparent unless they're dehydrated properly and the water is removed. So for some 3D cell culture models, we don't need this dehydration process. Process, the physical histo M approach is enough to remove that water, but for larger tissues, more water does need to be removed and dehydration is critical. The times for this will vary based upon the tissue type and size, which is called out in our protocol guidebook. And like I mentioned before, you should use methanol or ethanol at 4C for dehydration if you're working with fluorescent proteins. And I'll call out on the bottom here, compared to a brain that's been cleared with clarity or some other uh, techniques, this tissue does retain some of its pigmentation. And the reason for that is this tissue, the lipids have not been removed from it, the proteins have not been removed from it. What's been removed is the water from the site and because of that, we do have some of this yellowing and this coloration that you wouldn't see with some of the other techniques where we're actually removing parts of the tissue to better image it. So it is um, going to be less transparent than some other techniques, but it is less destructive to the tissue. So this approach can actually be reversed so that after clearing, you can actually reverse the tissue back to its original state and conduct uh, traditional 2D H&E and IHC to validate the results that you saw in 3D. The dehydration process should be conducted at room temperature with gentle shaking unless using ethanol. In that case, we're working at 4C instead of room temp like with methanol. Physical histo, like I mentioned, will cause some yellowing. This is increased with temperature, so you want to reduce the background fluorescence that yellowing. You can do all your processing at 4C, but this will extend the incubation time in each one of the steps. And then lastly, dehydration and clearing need to take place in a sealed jar. These solutions can be hygroscopic, and you want to make sure that the jar is in fact sealed, that you're clearing the tissues in. Now for physical histo 1 and 2, which are used with whole tissues, you want to use approximately two times the volume for both of these reagents. This is called out in the protocol guidebook. 
uh, but a good rule of thumb is 2x the volume. And then for 3D uh, cell cultures, they should be cleared with what is called histo-M, and we use approximately 100 microliters per well in a 96 well plate for an average sized 3D cell culture model of 300 to 500 microns in diameter. And again, physical histo 2 is not compatible with polystyrene. You should use HDPE, polypropylene, or a glass container. And then to wrap up here, I want to touch upon imaging. Imaging is where we get a lot of questions from researchers. So for confocal microscopy, which is the most common type of 3D tissue imaging, depth is usually limited based upon the type of objective that you're working with. It's NA, it's working distance, it's RI that's matched for. An air objective, which is most common, is limited to an imaging depth of between 500 and 1,000 microns, depending upon how transparent a tissue is. This depth can be increased to about 2 millimeters by increasing the gain and laser power with depth, but this will increase quenching and will cause some other imaging problems, and you will see some imaging aberrations the deeper you go into a tissue. But generally speaking, with an air objective, you can do up to about a millimeter of thickness for tissue. And we typically, for most of our projects and internal work here, use confocal microscopy just because it's more common, it's easier, and practically speaking, if you were to take a mouse brain and slice it into multiple one millimeter slices, instead of imaging it in one large piece, you can do that on any uh, inverted confocal system, and you can do it quite easily, and you can even automate it on a high content confocal system. Now for emergent objectives, if you want to get more depth with those, you can use a dipping objective which is matched to water, which is not ideal for physical histo, or you can use a BAB emergent objective which is uh, solvent compatible and can actually go directly into physical histo. We would suggest though that water dipping objectives are not placed directly into physical histo, and instead these types of water and glycerol emergent objectives are used with a double chambered cuvette, so you have a solution on the outside of a sealed container, or the inside of that container is Vizicol Histo M. So the objective does not come in contact with the Vizicol Histo M. And you can check those out on our website at vizicol.com backslash store, but they're called clear wells. Just to wrap up, if you have any questions or comments at all, please feel free to reach out to us at info at visitcall.com. We're excited to help you out and excited to answer any questions you have on tissue clearing or our Visicol Histo products. Thank you.